Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Kara here. And on this week's episode of the Becoming Immune Confident podcast, I have a treat for y'all. I have been following Chef Lorenzo for, oh goodness, over a year now. I am always entertained and I am learning so much. And I know you all are going to learn so much from this conversation. Lorenzo Tavani is a chef. He's also a forager, a gardener, a video creator, and an all-around health nut. After culinary school, he has worked jobs throughout the food system, including in professional restaurants and at a regenerative family farm. He now hosts cooking courses and works as a private chef in Columbus, Ohio. He creates online cooking courses, and he is just a wealth of information, has amazing energy, and I'm so excited to introduce you all to him. Lorenzo, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to sit down and talk with us. And we would love to hear more about your story. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been fun to uh, interact with you over the last year, going back and forth and cool to finally be face to face, at least as close to face to face gets. <laughs> We're in the same city. Yeah. You know, yet- I on our computers. Yeah, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> definitely have to make plans to meet in person. So as far as my story goes, you know, I grew up with lots of vacation, outdoor vacations and uh, family who garden and cooked a lot of homemade food, but was never really, you know, you're never really, you're just gaining through osmosis as a child. Throughout high school, I was very creative and played music and got a couple restaurant jobs later in high school. And that kind of led me into going the culinary route in college. I truthfully didn't have a whole lot of solid plans for what I wanted to do in college. I knew I needed to go and I was working in a restaurant. So it was the best bet for what I was doing then. Working through restaurants was really uh, difficult. I was simultaneously trying to live that kind of healthy life, living an active lifestyle, doing a lot of gym, but then also immersed in the bar culture and partying scene that restaurants tend to come with. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to live that healthy life. I was like living two contradictory lives. And I had a couple activity based injuries that caused some knee surgeries to need to happen. And that kicked me out of restaurants. Mm -hmm. I started a part time job at a gym and started working on my personal training certification. So I became a certified personal trainer. And once my knees were healed up, I was working kind of in a restaurant, doing some personal training on the side. And really, that's when the health and the nutrition and everything started to snowball for me. When I realized everything in our bodies were all connected and synergistic, I was like, oh, this food is really important as well. So the food and where our food comes from kind of snowballed into regenerative agriculture and how the food system works. I worked for a couple of years at a small family farm where I was milking cows, feeding pigs, and collecting tons and tons of eggs on a daily basis. I worked for the better part of a year at a slaughterhouse, kind of really deep in the food system, getting a good overlook of how our food comes to be. COVID happened and I was laid off and I took the private chefing I was doing on the side a little more seriously. And that's just kind of snowballed into me trying to expose more people to how their food is grown, where it comes from, and why that all matters. And that's kind of culminated into these community-based food events that are either foraging focused or just local food focused, where small food producers can come together and show off their awesome products, highlighting the wild foods around us and enjoying our meals outside and getting outdoors and into nature. It's amazing. And I would love to hear, so how did you get involved in foraging? Kind of specific, like, where did that come in? And what is it? Because a lot of listeners may not know what that is. Yeah, totally. So foraging is simply navigating your landscape and looking for edible or somewhat useful plants and fungi that, you know, either could become a food source or a source of medicine I incorporate tons of wild foods and ingredients into the cuisine that I use in my dinners. And from a food standpoint, all of the cultivated foods that we have at the grocery store all originated from some wild relative to that plant. So the foods that we eat at the grocery are just hybridized versions of the wild plants that grow out in nature. And when 
harvesting those wild plants, the nutrition and the mineral density in those foods are much higher because of their natural environments and their more uh, native kind of growing. Foraging happened for me in 2020-ish, kind of end of mid-2019 and then foraging. And then when I was laid off during COVID, it really just gave me a ton of time to be out there learning. I think it just came with understanding where my food came from, seeing people pulling mass amounts of food, growing on trees in urban areas or mushrooms out in the woods that I'd only really seen in like restaurant situations. And just like this mass abundance of food that grows around us really got me interested. And I just got out, started spending time reading books, watching videos and recognizing some stuff that I saw and trying it. And it's really just snowballed from there. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can. I think back to my childhood and a couple little snapshots come to mind of these little, little hints of, you know, foraging. I remember my mom mentioning this idea that dandelions actually like were something that people ate sometimes as a really young kid. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then yeah. she immediately told me not to eat them because likely the ones that I was around had been sprayed. And so that was, you know, not a good right. idea. And then my dad is very much an outdoorsman. He has been, you know, since he was really young, kind of working on his grandparents' farm on the summers, and then also um, learning how to hunt and fish. And, and so that has kind of had this thread. But every spring, he would be really excited to go out looking for morel mushrooms. And so I know we're coming kind of up on that season, but these are like these little hints. But what the reality is for most, you know, vast, vast, vast majority of human history, these weren't just little hints or threads. This is how we survived. Yeah, even today in a lot of European cultures, South American cultures, there's a lot of foraging that still happens. It may not be the main part of their diet, but in each season, they might go do blueberries in this time of the year when the blueberries are ripe and collect all the blueberries and freeze them for the year or make jams and jellies. And yeah, there's a lot of tradition around it. I think a lot of wild food can take a lot of processing and it can take a lot of time and that can be kind of a good bonding moment for families to, you know, yeah. go out, get outside, collect food, bring it back as a collective, process it all together, turn it into whatever it is they're eating and kind of bond over that moment. It can be a special part of our lives. It's been a special part of people's lives even today. And then, you know, talk about before agriculture, humans living on the landscape were really just tending to wild plants and you know, more like a food forest kind of situation where they were working with the already available food sources and tending to them in a way that would benefit them, whether it's pruning for higher fruit yield or burning, doing controlled burns to open up more space in the understory. It's pretty amazing. Humans had a really large role on the landscape and mm -hmm. we've definitely taken a step back from being involved in nature and the stuff around us. And part yeah. of getting back and healing the earth is getting a better understanding of it and interacting with it, right? You're never going to heal something that you're not actively immersed in or being intentional about. Yeah. And, and we know not only is that healing for the earth, but it's also really beneficial for our own health when it comes to Absolutely. certainly our mental health, but also our immune system health, being exposed to, you know, the soil and different microbes and things out in nature really helps shift our immune system back into a better balance. That being said, for those who already have allergies or other things, you, you know, talk with your docs to come up with a good plan to keep you comfortable, but overall can be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I'm stressed, a good hike helps. You know, there's really something to being in that natural environment away from the man-made structures, just getting into the woods and right in a lot of Eastern medicine, they talk about forest bathing and all the benefits of just literally just going on a walk in the woods. Nothing more. You don't have to run. You don't have to do push-ups. Like just being out there is benefiting us so much, right? So I like to say yeah. that in my classes. It's like, even if you come home empty handed or you don't know any of these plants, your first 10 times going out to the woods, you are still benefiting from being out there. You're spending time in an environment that humans have evolved in for thousands of years. 
And it's no coincidence that it feels so good to be out in nature and go on a walk. It's like such an important part of being a human. And yet we spend like 90 to 95% of our time indoors. What tips might you give someone who is like looking to start making some of those changes? Is there anything that kind of, you know, you've seen other people do or maybe you found helpful yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, just being intentional about getting outside, whether it's a couple small 15 minute walks on a really busy day. I think in the busyness of life, it's really easy to get carried away with other things. But if you can just be really intentional about getting outside and just even a five to 10 minute walk makes so much of a difference for me walking around my neighborhood. And then, you know, if you want to get into the more like recognizing plants and getting more interested or in tune with your environment, just taking the same route and looking for a plant and using resources, whether it's online or a field guide, we can talk about good resources and just visiting that spot time and time again, seeing that plant in its different seasons. That way you can recognize that pattern in your eyes, get your reps in and you're outside, you're getting exercise, you're being in the open air. You're also like getting in tuned and using your brain to recognize natural patterns in your environment. That's something I like to do is take the same loop and kind of check on my plant friends along the loop and see their different stages throughout the season. And that's when you really start learning, you know, you're learning your plants and learning your environment. And then also, you know, getting that win-win of getting your walk and your steps in for the day as well. Absolutely. I think one thing that's helped our family, we have been incredibly fortunate where our kiddos have done like their daycare, preschool, they have really invested in nature education for the kiddos. And so at least once a week, they have nature Jared who comes in, who I know we talked wow. about you know, introducing you to, but that really has instilled this joy and this love of nature in them. And seeing that excitement has been contagious for my husband and I of like, oh yeah, let's get outside. Let's, you know, Earlier this week when it was so nice out, they really wanted to go for a bike ride, um, you know, before bedtime. And so sometimes just listening to those little pulls, whether, you know, wherever they come from can be really helpful. And let the little people. Yeah, we got to be better at channeling our inner child, right? It's like yeah, channel yeah. just 10% of our child energy. It's so important for adults to keep playing, interacting, yeah. having fun, climb a freaking tree, you know? <laughs> You're never too old, I, you know, you're never too old to climb a tree. Yeah. You know, I think now that you mentioned that, I think that is what that energy that I think you bring to your social media content is just that joy and that it is kind of this, you know, reminiscent of, you know, obviously you're an adult and you're teaching us adulting things, but there is this yeah. just joy that you can tell that you really love what you're doing and you're very passionate about that, it really helps you learn and want to keep tuning in to listen. So thank you for bringing that and for bringing that to all of us. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah. like I definitely goofy turning it on for Instagram too, right? You got turning it up a little bit for the gram and yeah, it's fun for me. I like being a goofball. I think like if I can use that, you know, I was the class clown in school. Some teachers loved me, you know, <laughs> they loved me and I was able to get the classes like totally off track um, with the goofiness. So now I like to say that like I'm using my powers in a more constructive way now that I've matured more. <laughs> Probably not super surprising that I was the kiddo getting in trouble for talking a lot. I was very studious, nerdy, but also definitely a chatty. That's how I got a detention at one point. When people are looking to try to eat in a way that is more mindful of the earth and the environment, what are some suggestions of ways that they might be able to kind of slowly make those you know, or even radically kind of make those changes? Yeah, that's a great question. I think definitely looking to your local food economy. Um, I know that's easier said than done. In certain situations, there are definitely parts of the United States that are a little more privileged in that way, whether agriculturally yeah. or just socioeconomically. But really tapping into that local economy, I think it's easier to do, you know, Google searching your local farmer's markets 
And, you know, going to places to where you can shop that in a situation where you can directly buy from that person, right? I think using labels as a guide is okay, but in the world today, what labels can mean, the ultimate form of trust is finding the person that's really raising that animal or producing that food product. And, you know, actionable stuff for listeners is spending time at farmer's markets and interacting with the people behind the booths, asking questions. Truthfully, some of this is just some education that we have to do ourselves. You know, finding books. A good book is The Third Plate by Dan Barber. Joel Salatin is a great author. Just some books that kind of give you light on the food system and, you know, what some labels could mean because there's a lot of uneducated people. It's nobody's fault. I think it's just a result of our busy society, but just learning and becoming a more educated buyer is really, I think, the next step towards improving our health and buying more intentionally. I think that starts one at farmer's markets, but just self-education of reading some books that pertain to our food system. You know, maybe visiting a farm, Google searching farms that have farm tours in your local area. Yeah. Just trying to find those people that are raising it, growing it, baking it. Those are the people that we can trust, the people that we can ask questions to, the people that will be honest. You know, that's where that good local high energy food comes from. One of the things I think that we have in common in our own ways and in our own kind of areas is talking about how things are not as black and white as a lot of the sound bites. Mm -hmm you know, would suggest and that there's so much in that that gray area, the nuance. And so maybe we can, if you're okay with dig in a little bit, kind of the food label, like what do some of these things really mean? And does that translate like, to, you know, how does that translate to our shopping? So if something says organic, for instance, like. Yeah. Yeah, the organic label is an interesting one. I'd say overall, it's a good thing to have organic certification. If you want to talk about an animal that has the organic label on it, all yeah. that organic label pertains to is the feed that the animal is eating. So that animal can be living in the same low quality conditions, living environment, and just fed a organic pellet and be labeled as organic. So I think, you know, a lot of people go by the organic chicken thinking that that chicken probably lived a healthier, happier life. Not necessarily the case. That label is really just pertaining to the diet that it ate. Um, pork, a good example, is vegetarian fed. Pigs are omnivores. So, you know, that pig was not eating the species-specific diet for the entirety of its life. And they use that vegetarian fed label as if it's like a selling point, you're like, oh, that sounds good. Veggies, like, you know, that's a veggie fed pig. That's a healthy pig. But in reality, pigs eat rats, pigs eat snakes, pigs, you know, pigs eat, um, <laughs> eat all this. Yeah, the, pigs will eat anything. And vegetables, you know, vegetables are great. It's like buying organic as best you can, I think, is a great thing. There's a good little tip for people like the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 list that they put yeah. out every year. Yeah. Of, you know, foods that are generally safer and less high amounts of glyphosate and sprays and pesticides and such. So that's always a good resource to look at when wanting to figure out what you can compromise on buying conventional versus organic. But, you know, the organic label is I think it's good to have the certification. It's good for some clarity. But just because it says organic doesn't necessarily mean it's good. I read that Joel Salatin book, This Ain't Normal, folks. At your recommendation, you had, I think, posted yeah. it on your stories or something. And he's a farmer in the, I think, Virginia, rural Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And really kind of shed some light on, you know, like vegetarian fried chickens. Like chickens should be eating bugs. They should have access to the ground. Mm -hmm. Like that's what they're supposed to, you know, and, and some of these things that, We've talked about it a little bit more on on older episodes of the podcast, but this greenwashing that comes on, especially with like skincare products and stuff, the same sorts of things are happening in our food system too, that they know that those labels sell. And yet, if it's the difference between eating an apple or not eating an apple because it's organic or not, just eat the apple. Like don't go buy some organic like goldfish instead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
you know, there's a diminishing return. You know, nobody's a bad person because they don't buy organic, right? Yeah. Like if you're eating conventional produce over processed bagged food, that is way better, right? So it's just buying the best within your means. Buy the most expensive whole real food that you can afford. And that is the best that you can do, right? Like all we can all do is the best we can do with what we're buying. Yeah. Some people can't afford all organic. That's okay. But the whole real conventional produce is much better than the alternative processed bagged junk foods. And it's okay too, that if your time, energy, health requires you to get some stuff that's frozen or, you know, a lot of times that was frozen during peak season too, to kind of add that little disclaimer. Yeah, I'm always recommending frozen vegetables for people, you know, it's like a bag of frozen vegetables is just such an easy thing to get veggies as a side on a busy weekday and whatnot. And you're totally right about the freezing. It's usually more nutrient dense than a vegetable that's been on the shelves, like sitting around for who knows how long. Sad little whim zucchini or uh, yeah, exactly. lettuce or something. Exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit more about kind of some of those, you know, one of the things that you post often about too is meal prepping or kind of batch cooking. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to share just a little bit about how that weaves in. Kind of is a, a segue from, you know, when things are in season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. You know, so I think healthy eating and cooking at home gets a rap of being inaccessible, too time consuming, maybe boring, you know, healthy food not being great. But the truth is we're all just not great cooks. The average person is just like not great at making their food taste good or have a very efficient time in the kitchen because they don't do it very often. So, you know, I think the one thing that we can all do better is just spending a little more time in the kitchen and some really good practical techniques or like efficiencies to add into your meal prepping is just bulk prepping and making more than what you need in the moment. I think a lot of people get caught up in the daily having to cook and they end up cooking enough for that day. And then they're in the same situation tomorrow and having to kind of reinvent the wheel every single day. Whereas, you know, for instance, you could cook six or seven pounds of pork shoulder at the beginning of a week and use that in so many different ways throughout that week, whether it's pork carnitas or you want to do enchiladas or you do some of the pulled, pulled pork like barbecue style with some roasted potatoes freezing some of that pulled pork away so it's like an easy meal that you can pull out at a later date really incorporating some of these smart storage techniques are how we become more efficient in the kitchen saving ourselves time making healthy eating more sustainable and realistic because like it's true even me i'm the guy that cooks and i have a hard time keeping food constantly in the fridge because i'm busy doing stuff all day and these little freezing tips and making extra and, you know, making large batches of stir fry sauce so you don't have to make stir fry sauce every time. It's these simple little efficiencies that can really make the whole thing more enjoyable. And, you know, people probably assume me as a chef, I'm eating like fancy stuff all the time. Sometimes my meal is just like sometimes we just have sloppy joes with a little side salad, you know. But you can better believe that I made four times the amount of sloppy joes that we needed. A bunch got frozen. We eat some for three days. So now I have sloppy joes that I can pull out weeks in the future to really just like save myself time. So in my opinion, I don't think we should ever be cooking without thinking about some of the element being made and made bulk and saved for our future self. I think that's the only way to make the healthy home cooking efficient and sustainable. That has been really key for our family. I know like over the last few years and is especially helpful when illnesses hit or my Sjogren's flares up or, you know, work gets busy. Like then you have kind of these fallbacks that are really helpful mm -hmm. to kind of tide you over. Yeah. And it's this that like, yummy, you know, food that was cooked with love. Sometimes even like literally my five-year-old will literally blow kisses into the soup. Um, and I will say is a mom like doing less dishes. Hallelujah. Like if you're batch or bulk cooking, you're not making that much more mess at all. And it's less cleanup. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Cooking for a week, you know, cooking three times the size of a recipe versus cooking a one time batch. You know, if you scale it up three times, it's really not going to take you much more time. Yeah. Especially if it's like chilies and stews. It's like never make enough chili for one day. And, you know, freeze it into jars. And I think what a mistake people make is they make a pot of chili and then they eat chili for seven days straight. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you have a freezer. Freeze half of it. Don't eat chili for another month. And then when you guys are not sick of chill anymore, you can pull those jars out and you can have your chili that's already made. Yeah. Or like I had an odd amount a little while ago where it wasn't quite enough to feed the whole family, you know, for like a bowl of chili type meal. So we mm -hmm. put it on baked potatoes and had like chili potatoes with that little, you know, kind of the one mason jar versus the two we would have needed for chili dinner. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, I just pulled out a jar of pork carnitas and it's like exactly there's so many different ways I could use it. We could have pork carnita tacos. I could make enchiladas. I could crisp it up and put it on top of a baked potato like you did. I could mm. do it in a breakfast hash with a couple of eggs and some potatoes for, you know, tomorrow's breakfast. Like it's Ooh, so many yeah. different options. And those yeah. ideas might not come to the average cook, but try it. But just cooking more often will make you a better cook and it'll make it more enjoyable. And it is like maybe the single most important thing that we can control in our everyday lives is the food going in our bodies. And I will just throw out there, even for those of us that are cooking often, sometimes we will have missteps and that is okay. Yeah. One mm -hmm. of the things I learned recently, and I, I think I maybe already shared it on the podcast, but I'm going to share it again. Fail is a first attempt in learning. So it's not really a That's fail. That's good. Yeah, That's good. I like that a lot. Cool. That's good, yeah. Anytime you start doing anything, you're going to suck at it for a while, you know, until you don't suck anymore. Yeah. Like my videos sucked when I first started making them. The food, yeah. my food wasn't the best food. It wasn't that great when I first started doing it, you know? Yeah. One of the things that I think, you know, going back, and then I know that we both have to wrap things up, but learning some of those fundamentals like salt, acid, fat, heat, you know, kind of those elements, those are those tools in your tool belt along with mm -hmm. learning different techniques and things that really is what you're kind of teaching folks how to use too, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about ingredients as roles that need filled mm -hmm. to get to your desired outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And... The recipe is just like, it's a map with a bunch of different directions that you can take. And those ingredients, you know, you have a recipe with, let's say you have a sweetener in there. Well, you could use granulated sugar, but you could also use maple syrup. You could use honey. You could use agave. And being able to understand the role that each ingredient plays in a recipe will give you that ability to kind of cook more intuitively and understand you know, what you could sub in there to get you to a very close desired outcome or, you know, close to that original recipe. Yeah. A lot of what I'm working on with the coaching is these kind of recipe formulas where it's exactly that. Each ingredient is categorized into the role. And then at the bottom of each formula, there are different ingredients that could fill that role, common ingredients that people would have. So it kind of gives you that permission to flex and cook more intuitively and that's where you learn you know and then eventually you don't need it it's like well i've made sloppy joes a hundred different ways with a hundred different ingredients and i've gotten to a place that i like and uh it is it's just cooking tasting your food trying it and learning and you know being intentional with how those ingredients work together where can people find you because I think everyone's going to want to go find you and follow you on Instagram and check out your website and sign up for a class. LorenzoCooks.com is the website. And on Instagram, it is Lorenzo with two underscores cooks. So sadly, I check every now and then to see if one underscore Lorenzo one underscore cooks is taken. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, we have two underscores in between. <laughs> Just that's what it is. We will link to both of those in the show notes. And I think you have some, 
Are your foraging classes that are coming up, are those already filled? Or do you have a couple spots Most left? of them are filled. Okay. Yeah, most of them are filled. April 20th, I have a couple spots left. Okay. And then I'll be releasing another date, hopefully in March, a couple more in April, and then cool. May, June, July, and through the rest of the year, we'll have classes. So just keep an eye out, learnsocooks.com. That's where cool. all the classes and all the contacting info is and I'll update on socials and all that kind of good stuff. Well, I told you I'm going to try to get our allergy cohort together so we can go learn a little and spend more time in our environment until we get our weed walk up and running again, too. Yeah, uh, I would love that. Totally. Yeah. I'd love to have you guys. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation, and I hope the first of just many to come Go follow Lorenzo. If you're in Columbus, I know a lot of our listeners are and watchers are. Go sign up for a class or work with him virtually. And thank you. Thank you. Totally. High five and happy cooking. Happy cooking. <laughs> Take care. If you are loving this mix of self-discovery and science found here on the Becoming Immune Confident podcast, I'd love to invite you to sign up for my email list. Hop over to drkarawada.com and hit subscribe to ensure you don't miss out on any insights into new immune system science or how we can harness healing through our daily habits. Hey there, amazing listeners. Before we wrap up today's episode, I want to take a quick moment to ask for your support. If you're enjoying the content of the Becoming Immune Confident podcast we're bringing you week after week, there's a simple but incredibly impactful way you can show your appreciation. You see, leaving a review is like giving us a virtual high five, and it helps our podcast reach even more people who could benefit from the valuable insights, entertainment and inspiration we strive to provide week after week. So if you're finding value in what you hear, here's what you can do. Open up your podcast app, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other platform, and give us a glowing five-star review. We're dedicated to bringing you the best and your feedback helps us fine tune our content to suit your interests and needs. But hey, don't stop there. If you have a moment, leaving a few kind words in the review section goes a long way too. Share what you love about the podcast, your favorite episodes, or how it's made a positive impact on your life. Your words not only brighten our day, but they also encourage others to join our incredible community. Remember, every five-star review and every word of encouragement counts. It's like fuel to keep us creating, innovating, and striving to make your listening experience even better. So if you're up for it, show us some love by leaving us that virtual high five in the form of a five-star review today. And a huge shout out to all of you who have already taken the time to do so. You rock. Thank you for being a part of our podcast journey, and we can't wait to keep bringing you more amazing episodes in the future. Until next time, keep shining and keep listening and keep on building that confidence in yourself and your immune system health. Take care.